Good morning, everyone. This is me for my roughly two minutes of chit-chat, and I think we're up and running. I'm not quite sure what Graham's looking for. Um, you're looking for my phone? Um, okay. Um, glad this bit's informal, um, and glad, too, that this week we haven't dropped out. Um, for those in Melbourne, you'll know that we've just had the wettest August, 24 hours since for 20 years. I think a few couple of weeks back we had the sort of the coldest spell of days in more years than that. So we're having interesting weather, but obviously there's not a lot to talk about in lockdown, so we talk about the weather. But spring is going to give us a taste, I think, at the end of the week. Um, for those of you from overseas, I hope you're all safe and not in lockdown. And we are hoping that our lockdown is beginning to bite the number of cases, but it's been a bit slower this time than last, probably because the virus had got away from us more this time than last. Anyway, thank you all for your tremendous support and encouragement to us during this time when we're to having church in a way none of us dreamt we would be having it. So I will now hand over to Graham just a few seconds before 11 o'clock. Well, thank you, Christine. Um, well, good morning and welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church. Uh, I'm Graham and uh, thank you for joining us this morning or whatever time of day it is where you are. This is our 22nd Sunday of streaming, so uh, we're uh, way longer than we ever imagined at the start. And for those of us in Melbourne, this is the third Sunday in stage four lockdown and curfew. So it's been pretty strange in Melbourne these last three weeks. We're told however many more to go. I think it was originally going to be six weeks at the start, but we're waiting to see what we're advised. When you're with us, we hope you'll take time to look at our website and uh, download the leaflet. We have a, a leaflet uh, which is on the website in a PDF format and it contains things that we pray for and it also contains a summary of today's sermon. So uh, that's, that's all there and available for you if you'd like to use it. We'd like you to make a comment on Facebook. Uh, and just to be in touch with us in whichever way you find easiest. Today we'll have Amanda playing viola again. We'll have uh, Ian will be our Bible reader today. Christine will talk about Young at Heart. And the sermon series is on great texts of the Bible. And we're looking today at Abraham and his journey of faith. So shall we begin with prayer? Let us pray. God, we come to you as to a loving parent. We thank you for the invitation to come and to cast our cares upon you. You know that this is a very strange time for us. We're not used to such uncertainty in our community. And we do pray today that as we adjust to the changes that we've coped with in these uh, recent weeks, that you will help us to be people of faith and to look to you, to trust you as the stable center of our lives, the one around whom everything turns. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll use uh, this service and what is streamed from churches all over the place to build up your church and to create a people of faith to bring in your kingdom through the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now the video from Amanda this week, uh, and thank you, Amanda, for this. It's a prayer from Hansel and Gretel by E. Humperdinck. Uh, so let's uh, take time to let the music uh, still our souls.
Well, here I am with another Young at Heart, or Y at H, as I've started calling it myself. In the last few days in Victoria, but not just in Victoria, it's become clear that the disabled, as well as the elderly, have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. The place of the disabled in our society has always been very near to my heart. <coughs> Excuse me. My inspiration for, for today's talk came from another current TV series, One Plus One. It's not that we are watching TV all the time, but we are trying to watch some of the programs that really inspire us and inform us. One Plus One is simply a one-on-one -on -one interview. Various journalists have led it up till now, but at the moment, Kurt Fernley is interviewing various well-known sports people, at least so far they've all been sports people. Kurt Fernley was born in 1981, as was his interviewee this past week, he, or two weeks ago. He's an Australian wheelchair racer who has won gold medals at the Paralympic Games and crawled the Kokoda Track. Now, if any non-Australians don't know what the Kokoda Track is, just check it. Kokoda, K-O-K-O-D-A. Court has a congenital disorder, and I have to read this, called sacral agenesis, which prevented fetal development of certain parts of his lower spine and all of his sacrum. Several years ago, we saw a program about him, including his childhood, which was so impressive. He grew up in a big family in a small country town and enjoyed a lot of support and literal carrying by his siblings and most, though not all, of his schoolmates. Before this interview, I'm going to before this interview I'm going to talk about today, we had already seen him interview David Alcott, the Paralympian tennis player. The last time we saw him, he interviewed Ash Barty, who, as the Australians will all know, is the world number one women's single tennis player. And she's not going to the US Open, so I don't know what will happen to her title anyway. But the person I want to talk about is the person in the frame with court, Eliza Alt Connell. To my shame, I did not know anything about Eliza before this interview. I'm not good at watching sport of any kind. She was also born in 1981, six months after court. That's just sheer coincidence. She is a wheelchair racer. She survived meningococcal disease and plays a very important part in raising awareness of that in the Australian community. As the interview bega begins, can we go back to that first one, please? All we observed was this beautiful, and she really is very beautiful, lovely dynamic face She's articulate, she's positive, and as you see, of course, they're both sitting down through the whole interview. Then we had a passing reference to Ninja Cockle, then to her prosthetic legs, and only much later do we see how disabled her hands are and how damaged her arms. In the program, we see a photo that we wanted to show today, but was obviously copyright. And I would encourage all Australians to watch this program if you haven't seen it. It's on ABC iView. We see a photo of Eliza when her body, including her four limbs, nothing was damaged. She was a healthy 16-year-old chilling out with a friend the day before her life changed forever. 
There was no vaccine for meningococcal when she was a child, and I won't go into the details. They're in, or some of the details of how she, she survived are in the interview. She calls herself blessed at one point, and I think she truly is blessed in that she sees the silver lining, not the cloud. And all of her what ifs are about what if such and such had happened or not happened, pointing out how much worse the outcome could have been. She was put into an induced coma and while she was in that coma, her parents had to decide whether to let her die or to give permission for the 16-year-old daughter to have her legs amputated. They, um, am they opted for amputation. And Eliza says of them, what strength that took. I had the easy part. I was in a coma, and when Kurt sort of said, hmm, she said, well, relatively speaking, I had the easy part. She also says that her parents' courage in making that decision, when she learned about it, led her to believe she had to make the most of her life, to live with hope. We don't hear details of what a painful struggle it must have been for her and her family to reach where she is now, nor of the hardships her husband took on board, took on board when he fell in love with her and then committed to marriage. We can only imagine. And I don't think Eliza would like us to focus on them anyway. One of the many wonderful things that have happened is that despite being told they could never have biological children and accepting then that they would adopt children, they now have three beautiful biological children, which I think we're about to see a photo of. There, the par two parents are with their three children, and the next photo shows the three children a little bit older, looking at all their mum's medals. And Eliza dropped out of competitive wheelchair racing when she was having her children. But one of them said to her, I think when they were watching the 2016 Olympics, Mum, you were so cool when you raced. So, she's back in it, but of course, 2020, where she was supposed to be racing, those Olympics are not happening, and who knows what 2021 will bring. The boys at our children's school talk about her robot legs. The girls call them her Barbie legs. One of her children, yes, you can see them in that photograph, one of her children asked her if she felt sad about getting meningococcal. Her reply, how can I be sad? I have a wonderful life and I have you. Now, why did I want to talk about Eliza? Well, there's a lot of talk at the moment about the search for a COVID vaccine, and as a nation, we have just signed up or are signing up to one. I believe in vaccinations, especially in the context of countries like Australia, where the regulations around all medications are so strict. So ELISA is, I think, an important example of what happens when there is no vaccination. The interview mainly fo focused on Kurt and Eliza as individuals, not on their disabilities. The people they are, the people they have become, that's what's front and centre all the time. Now, I have a dear friend who had polio as a child. She now, like all polio survivors, and there's so many did not survive, she has post-polio syndrome. She's noticed when she's out walking with her husband, usually on her crutches, but sometimes she has to go in her scooter if it's a particularly bad day, she has noticed 
that people will smile and acknowledge her husband and ignore her. Now, please, can we all make sure that we never do that? People with disabilities are people and they want us to react to them as fellow human beings. And you'll be surprised by the responses. I also was impressed by Eliza's positive attitude. She is really naturally, with a, it's not a forced thing, she is positive. Finally, though, I wanted to just make one, just um, refer to one quote from Eliza. She says her advice to her children is to follow, follow one's passions and make the most of your life. And that reminded me of the advice given to me by one of my Sunday school teachers more than six decades ago. And it's, he was quoting, and it was a he who was so caring about all of his Sunday school students. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Now he was actually quoting from the writer of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9, verse 10, who had written that millennia ago. And who better than the Apostle Paul to finish with? because he quoted Ecclesiastes in his letter to the Christians in Colossae, and that is chapter 3, verse 23. What, and I will read that because he quotes it and expands it. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as though you were working for the Lord and not for human beings. So let's all do what we find to do with passion, with love, as if we were doing it for Jesus himself. May God bless us all. Thank you, Christine. And now our Bible reading is going to be read by Ian, and uh, it's from Hebrews 11. It's the first 12 verses.
Thank you, Ian. Well, may God bless his word to us as we reflect on it this morning. Well, we are exploring great texts of the Bible. And uh, these are passages of scripture, not just necessarily favorite texts, uh, passages, but they're passages that unite the texts of the Bible in ways that help us to see the big picture. Why a book of uh, more than uh, 40 authors uh, written over a thousand years can be published as one book. No one would say that uh, or deny that the Bible is a book about faith. It invites faith. But what is faith? What do we mean uh, to have faith? Well, today we're looking at a passage from Hebrews that tells us about faith, the passage Ian has just read. And I've used this image to go with it, which, I, which I'll explain a little later on. It's actually the uh, old treasury buildings in Spring Street, Melbourne, one of the, I suppose it's neoclassical buildings. And I've used it to go with this, uh, this morning's thoughts about Abraham, who was, as you heard there, looking for a city, or hoping or waiting for a city. Uh, so today we're looking at this passage and it talks about uh, something that crops up again and again through the Bible. We'll observe how Abraham fared as he journeyed in faith, in, with faith in an unseen God. And so the uh, key verse, I suppose, would be Hebrews 11 verse 10. But we're looking at the whole theme of Abraham, especially as it is in Genesis. You're looking for a city and in, in uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 11, we're told at least four things that stood out to me. The first is that Abraham stepped out in faith. there has got to be a first step. The second thing is, uh, where did he step? Which way did he go? What did it mean? Where was he going? The third thing is that faith steps with new values. And finally, we're going to look at the idea of an unseen city. So, so let's think about these things, beginning with stepping out in faith. Well, of course, uh, a journey here is a metaphor. Uh, you can step out in faith without, without going anywhere. It's a matter of an inner journey. It's a, somewhere that your mind takes you and something that happens in the way you see things. So uh, a journey is a metaphor for faith in development or under development. So let's bear that in mind as we journey with Abraham. He grew up in a city called Ur. Now, I've never been to Ur, but I'm very interested in it. And uh, this is the ziggurat at Ur. It's been largely reconstructed, the, uh, the first level of it. And in the middle, you can see uh, the remains of the old mud bricks. Uh, there were mud bricks held together with, uh, with bitumen, naturally occurring bitumen. And in the flat lands of southern Iraq, uh, this massive uh, sort of pyramidal structure was built. It's estimated to have looked something like this uh, in, uh, in its original condition. Uh, and I was a little envious when I saw that uh, uh, U.S. Army chaplains took uh, American soldiers to visit it when they were on leave. The idea that uh, you could take your... your uh, uh, people you are interested in, interesting in the, interested in teaching about the faith, to uh, this great monument. Uh, of course, uh, one wonders how they might have journeyed in faith with the role that they had. But let's just relocate this in our minds. We're talking about southern Iraq. It's very flat. You might remember that there's an enormous flat area there that uh, where the Marsh Arabs live and uh, which they suffered immensely in the, uh, in the, in the two wars, the, especially the uh, Iraq-Iran war. Uh, the uh, marshes were flooded with, uh, with oil. Uh, so in that part of the world where it's so flat, low-lying country, I want you to imagine for a minute what a moonrise over a ziggurat might have looked like. This, the, these pyramidal structure, this pyramidal structure with moonrise behind it across the desert, perhaps, um, perhaps a, a, a differently coloured disc as it changed and rose, 
Uh, and the uh, goddess that was worshipped here was the, was the moon. Nana Sin. That was the temple that was built atop the ziggurat. And moonrise in the desert must surely have been stunning. Each month large and colourful, the great disc arises and slowly turns to silver, captivating and powerful. Yet Abraham left it all behind. What was he thinking? Well, he took what he had and he set out on a journey. Of course, his father was with him at this stage and Terah and Abraham and the wider family set out on a journey. But Abraham trusted that an unseen God had made promises to him. It was a covenant. God had said, this unseen God said, I will be your God. Leave this behind. Travel with confidence in me. I'm going to give you three things. I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you land. And I'm going to make you a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Look up, Abraham. Consider the stars. Think about that. Or look at the sand. You'll have more descendants than there is sand on the seashore. Well, faith still involves charting a new course. And we need to ask ourselves, I think, at what points in my life have I made that new chart, that reorienting of my life around the things that God has brought to earth, as it were, through his word. Well, Abraham began a journey. The journey was up the Euphrates River to a place called Haran, about a thousand kilometers. And uh, it was uh, following the route of what we call the Fertile Crescent. I'm sure you've heard of this. If you go up the uh, Tigris, Euphrates Rivers, you come to the mountains of southern Turkey. And then if you come down the coastal strip, this is uh, avoiding the desert. Uh, so you, you can come to Canaan, the land of promise. But Abraham didn't know where he was going. Later, after uh, getting to Haran, he had to travel further. And the end of the journey wasn't in sight. Why did he do this? Well, the answer had very little to do with the length of the journey, but everything to do with the one who had called him. Not that faith in an unseen God came easy to Abraham. He struggled with his failures, his nerve failed, he told lies, and he jeopardized the promises. He was frightened, but he kept the promises in view. It was the Lord who had called him, who had made a covenant with him. He remembered the promise about the stars, that they would be, uh, his descendants would, in, would come and, and would flood into the world. So faith struggles with the, ex the existential circumstances of our lives. We have maybe one plan of what we think they will be like. But when God intervenes or intrudes in our lives, things can change. Our things can change in all kinds of unexpected ways. Christine was just talking about uh, Eliza Alt-Connell and the uh, way in which her life was changed as a 15-year-old, 16-year-old girl in the course of one night. It was just astonishing. And how she's come through that is extraordinary. And so we, we, we don't know what the future holds. But like Abraham, we're invited to believe in a God who holds the future. Now, blessing to all the nations of the earth, <laughs> that must have seemed just way beyond reality. But it is there in the Bible and it, it comes up in the Psalms, for example, in the songs of Israel, you'll find out that the, 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 the nations of the world are in view. They have to be invited to join in praising God and to discovering him for themselves. Uh, so Abraham's journey uh, raises questions for us. Faith raises questions. But there won't be questions that aren't already in the Bible that haven't already been asked by faithful people. You read the Psalms. How long, O Lord? Why? When? These questions keep popping up as people struggle in their lives with the demands of faith. But we need to remember that faith steps out with new values. Abram left his home to live as a foreigner in another land. How insecure 
might he have felt. Not only that, he left a city to live in tents. Imagine the insecurity such a change might cause. Think refugees, think loss of income. I think you can get a feel straight away from the situations around the world today where people have lost those things, lost their state, lost their wealth, have nowhere to call home. But the security he had was the covenant promise that God had entered into what was really like a kind of marriage contract with him. And God wasn't going to renege on that. God was faithful and he invited Abraham to keep trusting. Consider the commitment of Jesus. It was in response to this covenant. On the last night he was with his disciples. He explained his coming sacrifice as the body and blood of the covenant, the meal which with its simplicity and power is shared by Christian churches around the world. The image I selected to go with our reflection today on faith and fidelity as this idea that faithfulness is what shapes the future. But I use this image, the old treasury building in Spring Street, Melbourne. It built, was built to house the treasury department of the government uh, in uh, the 1850s and it typifies something solid, something secure. Yet the Treasury Building was established by the Gold Rush in Victoria, which began in 1851 and petered out in 1853. Few things are as unreliable as a gold rush. Some make a fortune, others lose everything. So what shapes your values? That's the question that arises. How does faith shape your values? Well. It shapes our values uh, by asking what is, where is our treasure? What is it that we treasure? Is it the gold in the vaults of the treasury building? Is it the, uh, something else? Is it a, a hopefulness? Is it a relationship? What relationship? Could, could God, an unseen God, be trustworthy? Well, the blessing of Abraham included wealth. Not that it was guaranteed to him, but he did enjoy wealth. And it meant a huge adjustment to his values and his lifestyles. And although he did have wealth, it was his faith in God and not in riches which shaped his values. And he struggled with that, but that was what it did. And now faith steps to an unseen city. If the journey is a metaphor for faith under development, the city... Is a, is a metaphor for faithfulness, building faithful relationships. A city is a const construct. The Bible, the story of the Bible moves from a garden to a garden city in the book of Revelation. But the city itself is not a physical city that we're to think about. It's symbolic of relationships. And so here uh, we're to think about faithfulness in relationships. The city as construction is about building faith relationships. And this is what Abraham had to do. He had to trust God. And that trust had to be passed into his family. So Abraham set forth knowing only the promise of God. And he was confident that what he left behind could not be compared with the promise before him. As the writer to the Hebrews tells us, he was waiting for the city whose Builder and architect was God. The blessing of the nations, which appears in the songs of Israel that I've alluded to, uh, is, is not a major emphasis in the, in the Bible until the New Testament, until that covenant flowering which Jesus brought to them. Derek Kidner says, The blessing of the nations always imparted some sense of mission to Israel, yet it never became a program of concerted action until the ascension. So Pentecost and the ascension, says Derek Kidner, the fulfillment came with Christ. But Abraham and many succeeding generations did not see the fulfillment of the promise. As Christians, every Christmas we read Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, but we usually ignore the first verses 
the genealogy of Abraham because we forget that the life of faith comes to us through the line of Abraham. God has been at work in this story. The writer to the Hebrews makes this point again and again throughout the chapter. I invite you to read the whole of the chapter which Ian began for us today. But notice that the writer of the letter to the Hebrews goes on to say at the end of the chapter, the story of faith which comes to flower in the person of Jesus calls for faithfulness in the lives of those who follow Jesus today. He challenges us to think about the indescribable cost of our salvation, about what Jesus went through to make it actual, the cost of our forgiveness. And he says the faithful who preceded us in this long chapter of the heroes of the faith, the men and women of faith, he says they're like the spectators around an arena. And who's on the arena? Well, it's us. We are living our lives. The consummation that God had in store will be completed when we too have run the race of faith and come to journey's end. The holy city is the goal of the faith journey. It is the metaphor for the kingdom of God in its fulfillment, the embodiment of all that God's will represents and will be done uh, on earth as it is in heaven. It is our obedience and adoration of God who has loved us from all eternity. It's the, the God who long ago planned our redemption and has invited us to love and to trust. May we each find ourselves drawn out in faith and love to the God who so desires to bless us and indeed all the nations. Amen. Now, we come with prayers of intercession, and uh, I'll take you through them. Uh, they will be on the screen. Now I invite you to follow with me and then join in the Lord's Prayer at the end. O oh God, as we bow before you, we confess that you alone know the end from the beginning. Into the Google map of our lives, you have spoken your directions to faith, hope, and love. Help us to listen and to follow the route. Thank you especially that in the Lord Jesus Christ you came yourself to display a life of faith and as our guide to even become our Savior. Lord, in the maze of information, with our capacity to search and retrieve data, keep us from wasteful or harmful diversions, but tune us to your word day by day Unfold your good and gracious purposes in and through your people to bring blessing to others. In Victoria, we're grateful that the drastic stage four lockdown and curfew uh, have at last had uh, reduced the numbers of people effect, infect, affected by COVID and that the number of deaths is also coming down. We're also grateful that the particular plight of the disabled has been brought to the attention of the public and that Christine has reminded us all of that this morning. We pray for all health workers. May they have adequate PPE. We ask that infected health workers may regain health and strength. We lament the loss of health and productive work and difficulties imposed on student learners, as well as the difficulty uh, providing for dependents, even as we're grateful for the cooperation of governments in seeking to suppress the virus and minimizing the financial impact. Lord Jesus, you are the great healer. We bring before you all those whose mental health is adversely impacted by the virus, and especially during lockdowns. We're also concerned about the increasing number of people turning to gambling, alcohol, and other drugs. Prince of Peace, we bring before you the scourge of domestic violence, which has worsened during the lockdowns. We pray that perpetrators and their victims will seek and find the help they need before it is too late. We mourn with those who have lost loved ones and grieve for them. Even as we've heard of the sorrow of others 
and remember them in their loss. In our own small community, we pray for Ogilvy, newly bereaved, and remember the Russell and Norris families. As COVID-19 continues its silent and deadly global presence, we ask for nations ensnared by poverty and violence that you will bring forth good government and wise counsel and improve public health and hygiene. We have so much information about nations and people, about the powerful and the weak, about the privileged and the exploited. As we have followed events in Mali, Belarus and Russia, we thank you, God, that we live in a country where our leaders are held to account. Guide us that we might play our part in effecting change and supporting the needy for Christ's sake. We thank you for the positive signs of progress in the search for a vaccine. Please grant success to these endeavours around the world. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, who taught us to say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And now the benediction from the, the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 13. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. Amen.